So glad to have you here today. I'm going to start, the, um, I'm Jillian Bonke. Um, I'm ADL's uh, Divisional Education Director in the Central Division, and I have the privilege of introducing our guests here in just a moment. Before we get started, um, I'd like to put in the ADL Code of Conduct. Um, it'll be on the chat as well as on the screen. At ADL, we're uh, committed to, and um, dedicated to providing a safe and inclusive and respectful environment. You can take a second to look at our code of conduct now. Um, and just in case um, you're new to um, Spanish translation or closed captioning, I will also drop in the chat um, on how to access that um, as well. Again, thanks for joining us and let's get started. Um, today, we have some of the very best educators among us to share um, and start this conversation. Their, their lived experiences, their expertise as former school administrators. Um, and I'd like to get started in introducing them now. So first, um, we have Carla Chenault, who is a um, ADL Michigan Education Director. She is a former classroom teacher and building principal who really believes strongly in student voice. She comes to us today from Bloomfield, Michigan. We also have Dan Cohen, a former middle school teacher and, uh, and equity specialist with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. He is a focus on gender equity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and policy reform, and he is coming to us from Denver, Colorado. And we have Danielle Bryant, the ADL Austin Education Director. She's also a former, former campus administrator and teacher. She uh, resides in Austin, Texas, and is a doctoral student at Texas State University. So without further ado, let's get this conversation started. Thanks for joining us. And really quickly as well, if Jillian can copy and paste the closed captioning Spanish translation in the code of conduct back in the chat for everyone. I think just the host and panelists got it so far. And a quick note, you are all invited to put questions in the chat as we will have some time for Q&A at the end of our session. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Jillian. And we will turn it on over to Dan. Hey, thanks good morning good afternoon everyone um we are here to introduce you first to the anti-defamation league uh, and what we do our organization was founded in 1913 we are a global anti-hate organization with 25 regional offices in the united states as well as a few abroad our mission has been since 1913 to stop the defamation of the jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. So where we work, what we work on, um, our foundational expertise, as you can see on the screen, we do a lot of work in investigation and research, um, educating and training, uh, which we are all a part of, and advocating and assisting um, in, uh, with elected officials um, and policymakers on rights issues. Hi, I'm Carla, coming to you from a beautiful day in Michigan. And I wanna share a little bit about our anti-bias framework. So when we do anti-bias work, we always start with exploring identity. Identity is something that we all have in common and it's the way in which we see the world. From there, we talk about our differences and we talk about how those differences can result in bias. And we talk about language and vocabulary so that we have a, uh, the, the words to guide our work. From there, we talk about the fact that bias is universal. We all have bias and it's learned. The good news is it can be unlearned with intention and practice. We always like to end our workshops and our lesson plans and our curriculum with reflecting on how we can be change agents, how we can be champions of justice. So our learning objectives for today are to identify some proactive approaches to prevent incidents of bias, also how to respond to incidents of bias and bullying. We also wanna talk a little bit about the relationship between home and schools. And from there, we wanna leave you with some of ADL's resources that we uh, know will be helpful to you in this conversation. So why now? Why are we hosting this today and sharing all of this information with you? 
Well, at the Central Division, when we got started with planning this webinar, we were thinking of all of the resources, all of the tools and programs that we at ADL have to offer, and how it's really important for us to share those in a meaningful and thoughtful way with you all, because sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming. And as an, a leading anti-hate organization, and one that has so many resources to help parents, families, students, and caregivers, we wanted to connect those dots a little bit. It's the beginning of the school year. We know for some of you, this is the last couple days of summer stretch. For some of us, myself included here in Austin, we've been back at school for over three weeks. So it's important to start that year off on the right foot, but also it can be a fresh start. So as we go through our conversation today, we want you all to keep in mind that <clears throat> excuse me, that we're here to support you, that you have an opportunity to build a relationship at any point in time with your student's school, with their community, with other parents, with teachers, but also that our expertise, as Carla mentioned, as former school administrators, former classroom teachers, and now as all three education directors, we have some of those tools and resources. So we're here afterwards with any other questions that you might have. But as we start the school year, what's really important so we remember where are our kids at? So for those of you at home with young children, this might be a really exciting and nerve wracking time because it's the first time your child is going to school. They're energetic, they're loving activity. They're feeling very curious, imaginative, also ambitious. Maybe some of you had a child at home that said, I've got this. They didn't even need you to carry their backpack in on that first day. They're so excited and ready, but maybe some that were a little more hesitant. What this means for bias and bullying is that children are eager to make friends. They're making new connections every day. On the drive home from school, you might hear a different student's name every single day in the car because so many new friends are being made. That can also be an opportunity for another student to feel slighted or for your child or student to feel slighted as well. We also see that we hear the word no more in that early childhood stage. Students are starting to challenge adults, but they also deeply, deeply rely on them for reassurance. So that's why it's really important for us to start going in a little more when it comes to, when your child comes to you with a question, with a need, it's important that you reassure their feelings, that their feelings are valid and helping them develop those tools for how are they going to respond. Finally, your children are developing coordination. And that's important to keep in mind because who doesn't love when they think of a long line of kindergarten or first grade students walking down the hall? It's definitely more difficult than for those middle school age students as well. Then we start to get in to the tween transitions. Some of you might have students at home or in your classrooms that have just started that major middle school transition. That can be a really difficult time as students are becoming more aware of global issues and bigger world ideas. They see the world around them. They're curious. They want to learn more about what's going on for people in their community, but also in communities unlike theirs. We all know that students at this age are quick to emotions. A small feeling to us might be a big feeling for them. It can feel like the end of the world when a, when a peer or a friend has slighted them. They might feel left out. They might feel discouraged. They also might have really exciting feelings, feelings of joy and jubilation when they come home saying, oh my goodness, I want to tell you all about what happened at school today. We also see these very normal and developmentally appropriate feelings of building critique of self and critique of others. This is an opportunity for you as the adults in a child or a student's life to interrupt. And we'll talk a little more about what that interruption might look like, but you might hear as a child talks negatively about a peer or a situation, how you're responding is really important. And finally, that difficult shift from seeking validation from adults is shifted to seeking validation from peers. And I know as a former fifth grade teacher that that was always so apparent. I didn't matter anymore as the teacher, what my opinion was of a, of a student's behavior, of what was happening. They're looking to one another for that, for that validation. And this continues as we have further adolescent development into those teen years. Those cognitive changes and shifts are really critical. However, going back to that same idea of being quick to emotions with the tween transition, in high school that happens as well. 
we know that it's more likely for children at, in the teen ages to be more risk-taking. They're thrill-seeking. They're pushing those boundaries. That might be, that's happening at home. It's happening at school as well. We might be getting more pressure from peers, a desire to fit in. Those boundaries might be compromised. So it's important that we're having conversa conversations at home and consistently about when do you say no? How do you interrupt? What does stopping and saying, I don't like what you're saying to a friend, what does that sound and look like? And teaching those skills. These are learnable skills that are being taught at home. We also see that deep need for belonging. I don't know about you, but I can remember very clearly how, how much I wanted to belong as a teen and as a tween. And that feeling is really important to be filled also with self-confidence. How are we making sure that our children in our classrooms and at home are feeling confident in their decision-making skills, but also when it comes to interrupting that bias and hate? So why is all of this important? Why do we need to make sure that we have those skills and tools at home to have conversations around bias and bullying? Well, we know that students that are the targets of bullying have increased rates of anxiety and depression. We also want to make sure that as those developmental milestones are happening, we recognize what's developmentally appropriate, like being four years old and saying no, and what's develop, developmentally inappropriate, like lashing out physically in middle school and somebody getting in, in a physical altercation or fight. We also know that there's negative and positive impacts on academic performance. Students that feel welcomed, that feel they belong, we see higher rates of positive academic performance because they're more likely and they feel more comfortable learning. We know that if you, what is it, Maslow's before Bloom, students need to feel safe before they can start learning. And that happens first at home and then at school. It's also important that students have a trusted adult. So I talk to students and educators about this all of the time at, at work and in trainings that building those trusted relationships happens with adults in the home, but adults in our community. And it's really important for students to have a trusted adult at school. And that might be you. And finally, we know that hate happens. We know that a mean comment, a mean moment might happen. Bullying occurs every single day. We have to talk about it in a real way, not in this distant, faraway sense. We at ADL like to anchor our conversations around hate in the pyramid of hate. Let me give everybody just a quick moment as I read through this, just to start to digest if this is your first time seeing the pyramid of hate. And when we talk about the pyramid of hate, we always start at the base. We have biased attitudes that can be stereotyping, insensitive remarks, microaggressions. So we continue to escalate acts of bias. That is where bullying falls because we know, and Dan will talk more about this in a moment, that identity-based bullying is what we see most frequently when it comes to bullying. And that in itself is an act of bias. We also see acts of bias through dehumanization, belittling jokes. As we make our way up the pyramid, we get into discrimination at the systematic, at the systemic form, excuse me, whether that's economic, political, educational, with housing segregation, with things like redlining. Bias motivated violence as a continued escalation, things like murder, threats, terrorism, vandalism. And then finally, at the top of the pyramid, we have genocide. Now, I am not asking us to stop and intersect, interrupt genocide through the skills and tools that we are going to be talking about today. However, we also know that this does not happen in a vacuum. We know that the pyramid of hate can happen at different levels and could be an isolated incident, but most frequently and most often, we see the pyramid of hate, we see those feelings, those beliefs, those acts happen down here. And this is our point of interruption. If we can interrupt biased attitudes in the moment, when they happen, if we can respond with urgency when an act of bias or bullying has occurred, we are less likely to escalate on this pyramid. And we know that to be true. So today, I hope that you anchor yourself in examples of the points of interruption being down here at the base at that foundation of the pyramid. Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Danielle. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, the state of bullying. Um, before we really get into it, it's important that we 
talk about what bullying actually is. Um, and we have a definition of bullying that we use at ADL. You can see it on your screen. I'm going to read it as well because it's super important that we really grasp the, dis the difference between bullying and playfulness, even though they cross over sometimes. Um, we know that this um, happens for sure, especially in schools. So it's repeated actions or threats of action. Um, when we talk about repeated actions and it comes to cyberbullying, I tell folks, yeah, it doesn't have to happen just one time and it's bullying or cyberbullying, but think about how quickly information travels on social media and texts and online and in gaming formats, all of that. That's repeating of that initial threat. So you can see the repetition can still count even though it was initially only one, one time. These threats of action or actions are directed toward a person by one or more people who have or are perceived to have, and we'll discuss perception in a moment, more power or status than their target in order to cause fear, distress or harm. Bullying can be physical, it can be verbal, it can be psychological or any combination of these. Think about exclusion, social exclusion, which is listed in the rest of these. These behaviors include also include name calling, obscene gestures, malicious teasing, rumors, slander, the social um, exclusion that I mentioned, damaging a person's belongings, vandalism, as well as threats and physical violence in person or online. I have a lot of folks say, well, how come you don't talk specifically about cyberbullying all the time? Because in our age today, cyberbullying is bullying. It is just the method and the means and the format of where these uh, behaviors are stemming from. As Danielle mentioned, super important to remember that bullying is almost always, always related to a target's identity. When we run workshops, we talk about the identity iceberg. Those things above the waterline are um, all visual, mostly identity traits and characteristics that we can see, um, yet some are below that waterline as well. Um, so it's easy, especially for kids. We go for the juggler when we want to harm somebody or hurt somebody, or um, you know, even when we want to say that we're joking, we tend to go for what we're seeing. It's right there, it's easy. However, identity includes uh, qualities and beliefs about a person, which are all, which fall under things like race, language, native language, um, nations of origin, religion, their image, sexual orientation, gender, on and on and on. Now, some of these, can definitely fall into categories of legality because they fall under um, civil rights laws and policies. However, we won't go into too much of that and we'll talk about that a little later, but it's super important just to really hold on to that idea that it's that identity and those bottom parts of the pyramid that Danielle shared with you, those stopping points, that's where those items are certainly happening. What we know about bullying. First, bullying is a behavior, not a person. Super important to keep that in mind. And we're going to talk about the importance of language and the roles in bullying incidents in just a minute. It's important to remember behavior, not person. 20% of students 12 through 18 report being bullied at school. 44% of students who witnessed a bullying incident ignore it and sometimes even join in. From 21 to 22, there was a 49% increase of anti-Semitic bullying incidents. 70% of LGBTQ plus students stated they were verbally abused. And almost 37% of students report being cyberbullied. 
And the bullying at schools uh, include rumors, being called names or insults, pushed, excluded, social exclusion, as we mentioned, threats, harassment, forced to do things they don't want to do, or that destruction of property. And also remember, and we see it a lot in some of our incidents, that it can be student on student, it can be student on adult, and yes, adult on adult as well. And those are all incidents of bullying that we need to be aware of um, in, those, in those spaces. 92% uh, of teens go online daily, and one in three report being cyberbullied by text, on social media, or through gaming. And almost all students report seeing others being bullied online. That leads to arguments and yes, to physical fights. It does not just stay online. Uh, it's very easy to find out where folks are these days. Um, and uh, that will extend down into um, actual physical, physical altercations. I mentioned that we were gonna talk a little bit about the roles in bullying and how important language is. Think for just a quick second about your own childhood bully or that kid who is always in trouble for bad behaviors at school, in the neighborhood. Everybody more than likely has at least one person that comes to mind. And they were known as the school bully the neighborhood bully. What we want to focus on is, again, the behavior, not the person. So rather than focusing on the bully, the victim, we want to talk about the behaviors, the persons initiating the behavior, who is doing the bullying, the person targeted by the behavior, what a lot of folks would say would be the victim or the target, but they are not the target. They are the person receiving the bullying behavior. And then the witnessing or those witnessing the behavior, what we would call bystanders, upstanders, those folks all flow into that. So we really want to, especially as adults, avoid labeling youth as bullies, victims. These labels tend to remain fixed and emphasize the false idea that bullying behavior is inevitable. I'm hopeful that the person or persons you thought of a couple minutes ago, when you thought about your childhood bully, that they are no longer that type of person and they have grown and expanded and they have a nicer view towards themselves and the world. According to stopbullying.gov, when youth are labeled with these terms, it sends the message that the behavior cannot change because we're labeling the person, not the behavior. It fails to recognize the multiple roles that children might play in different bullying situations. Sometimes the person initiating the behavior could be the person being targeted with that behavior. They can both be bystanders. So it's not all... Uh, you know, separate, you know, once, once you do bullying behavior, um, that's all you do. It's cyclical. They also disregard other factors contributing to the behavior, such as peer influence or school culture. We have too many bullies. We have so many victims. There's a great quote, once you label me, you negate me. And this is especially true when we're talking about the roles in bullying. So instead of calling a youth bully, use the youth who bullied. And rather than calling the, a youth a victim or a target, you can say the youth or person who was bullied. You may hear this as first person language when we're talking about other um, isms and phobias. Um, and in this case, in a lot of those cases, it depends on the person whether they like that or not, whether they accept the person first um, ideal. But in this, it's really important that this is the way that we put the person ahead of these behaviors. And the allies, that's where we all come in as parents, caregivers, families, educators, adults, fellow students, peers, community members, 
the allies. We need to see everybody modeling what we expect our students to see. So what do you do when your child is in these roles? We want to make sure that whether it is perceived or actual bullying, sometimes it can be perceived and it's not just a visual, um, or it might be actual. How do we know um, we need to, um, what roles we need to take? How are we responding as adults? Huge. Take a breath. I know it doesn't feel like it in the minute it's your child or it's your student or your grandchild, somebody you love, somebody you care about, somebody that you nurture, but we need to take that breath. Believe what they are saying. As soon as we say, really, that's going to negate what they're feeling and close them off. Support. Give them the support. Are you okay? When educators or parents um, that I talk to call in and we talk about an incident of bullying, the first question I ask, is the student okay? And people get taken aback a little bit by that because we want to get to the meat of it. We want to get to, you know, what are the consequences going to be? What's going to be, who's going to handle this? Where do I go? We need to focus on that it's a behavior and that we're going to believe what they're saying until we can take that breath and gather all that information that we can. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Carla who is going to talk more specifically about some of these ideas. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. A lot of really great information. So I'm going to address some of the frequently asked questions that we hear in this space. And the first question is, how can you support your student this school year? And I, I think the overarching answer to that is to be proactive. So we know right now that your schools are busy getting ready to receive you. Many of them are thinking about the values and the vision that they have for the new year. And they're thinking about how to create culture that's going to be inclusive and welcoming. There's a school not far from me. I passed them the other day. It's a all girl uh, Catholic school, high school. And in, in their parking lot on their marquee, they've written at this school, we cultivate sisterhood, <clears throat> excuse me, sisterhood. So that's what they're aiming for. And they're telling the whole world, we cultivate sisterhood. So as a family that um, sends a student to that school, you want to ask, what does sisterhood look like? What does it look like in the classroom? What does it look like in the hallways? And this is happening at schools all over. I was just at a, 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 a school district last week. I was working with a group of students. The superintendent uh, came in and he looked at us and said, in this district, we want all students to feel like they belong. So in answer to how can you support your student this year, now is the time to get proactive to learn what is that vision, what is that value that your school community is attempting to uphold and come alongside them and uphold it. You can do that right now by visiting websites. I guarantee you that there are fresh, fresh messages that have been posted from superintendents and principals sharing their heart, sharing their ideas for the new year. Whenever possible, you want to go to the school, be on campus. They're going to invite you in. They're going to have open houses. They're going to do meet the teacher night. They're going to be back to school, orientation. Take those opportunities to be in the, in the space where your students are, in the classrooms, in the hallways, and see how the manifestation of the community that they want to build, sisterhood, belonging, welcoming, see how that is playing out in, in concrete ways. Right? And make sure, as Danielle mentioned earlier, that you're building some relational trust with your students' teachers. It's really important um, for, for not only your peace of mind, but all students need to have at least one, preferably more, adults in their building um, whom they, they trust and that they can go to. And of course, you don't want to forget to identify your school's um, policies around anti-bullying and harassment. 
right? What are the protocols that are in place for students to report incidents of harm? Um, I was in a middle school just this morning and I was so happy there was a sign in the cafeteria and it said what to do if, if there's bullying. And the first point was let an adult know. Um, so you wanna know what the process is for reporting. And then you wanna know what is the school's approach for managing conflict? Um, there is a trend that many schools are, are moving toward a model uh, it's known as restorative practices and what's special about restorative practices is that it aims to address the bullying and as Dan said the behavior while keeping the people involved keeping their dignity intact and at the end of the day the idea is to restore community restore sisterhood restore belonging restore that welcoming inclusive environment next question so the next question that we want to address is what should you do if your student comes to you and says they've been in a harmful incident? The overarching theme here is restoration, right? Again, thinking about how you can be a trusted adult um, aiming toward a positive resolution. And that's what's really key here. So when we think about restorative practices, the practices that I shared earlier that many schools are adapting, they're being trained in these practices, there's a framework of questions that um, have been vetted and tried and shown to be effective. Um, if your student is saying to you that they have been harmed, then these questions are designed to elicit their feelings, keyword, their feelings, not our feelings as the adults, but their feelings and to help them be a part of the problem solving. You'll notice the questions, you know, what did you think when you realized what had happened? Their thoughts, what impact has this had on you? Their feelings, what has been the hardest thing for you? And most importantly, I love this question at the end, what do you think needs to happen to make things right? Oftentimes we find that students don't tell adults about bullying incidents because one, they don't want to face retaliation. Two, they don't want to be seen as snitches. And three, they don't always trust the adults to handle the situation well. And so it's important to ask, what do you need to make the situation right? And we need, as the adults in the space, we need to listen to that and try to honor that. The next set of questions um, <clears throat> are to be used if your student is the one who's doing the harming. And as Danielle and Dan have both kind of explained to us, you know, one minute you, you might be a target of a bullying incident and the next minute you might be the oppressor. And when that's the case, we want to use questions that elicit uh, understanding what happened, right? What happened? Uh, we want to uh, make sure there's some empathy building, asking that student, you know, to think about how their actions impacted others. We want to also have some accountability, you know, having that student take some accountability for their actions and asking, what do you think you need to do to make things right? So these are really good questions. What happened? What were you thinking? What have you thought about since? Who has been affected? by your behavior and what do you think you need to do to make things right? Next question. So the next question deals with what are some best practices for communicating with schools? And we've kind of alluded to some of the ideas already, but the overarching theme here is relational trust. Relational trust moving into these spaces now if, if an incident happens at school and your student tells a teacher obviously they're going to let parents and families know if the student is coming to the family it's important then for the family to let the school know and what you want to keep in mind here is that everybody is looking for a positive resolution so trusting that everybody is wanting the same the best for all the students in the community so some of the things that we, we, we recommend are, you know, going directly to the educator who is involved in the space where an incident took place. So if it's on a football field, you're going to the football coach. If it's in the English classroom, you're going to the English teacher. 
If it's a choir practice, you're going to the choir practice, the, the choir teacher. Always start with the educator who is in the space. In a perfect world, you're going to find time to meet face to face. So you can use email, but only use email to set up a time to meet in person for you, for the, for the, for the adult family, for the educator and for the student. All, all three parties need to be able to meet together to discuss uh, the incident. And again, thinking about how do we bring restoration to the community. And then we have a few don'ts. And I sort of alluded to this when I said go directly to the educator involved, but don't go above the educator's head. If the incident happened in an English classroom, go to the English teacher. Going to the superintendent does not help build relational trust between your student and the adults that they interact with every day. Right? They're going to see their, their, their English teacher on a much more regular basis than they're going to see the superintendent. So go directly to the, the, the teacher involved. Don't post on social media, and that goes without saying. When we post on social media, we are going to do more harm than good, right? The incident is going to be escalated, and that's not what we want to do. And it, it will erode trust, and that's not what we want to do. We want to restore community. And last, don't forget to include your student. Your student needs to be part of this healing process. Their voice matters, and the path forward is very much predicated on what's going to work for them. Next question. My last question is, how can ADL help? So ADL is an external partner, and we do record incidents of bias. So one of the things that you can do is you can report incidents to us. You can do that anonymously, and we will hold your confidence. But it's an opportunity for us to get uh, data and to get accurate data. And then also, we have a whole bunch of open source resources, and I mean some of the best resources available um, and they're open source and available to you and i'm going to turn it over to danielle who's going to tell you a little bit about our resources thank you carla it took me a second to get unmuted there so before we dive in we see a lot of amazing questions coming in on the chat and we'll have a couple of minutes to address some of those as best we can but you'll also see on screen here in just a few moments, a QR code with a lot of different resources for you all. And in one of those resources, we have a guide for talking to young people, because as Carla mentioned, that relational trust is important, but we also know developmentally that in the tween and um, young adolescent stages, they might not be as comfortable talking. So how do I keep that door open and keep that conversation going? First, learn as much as you can not necessarily about the incident alone. What are they searching on the internet? What jokes are being made in class? What comments are being made? What are they interested in? Learning as much as you can to make those connections is really important and it takes some work. And I know it's not easy, but that's where some of the ADL resources can come in handy. And there are a lot of other online resources such as PBS Learning Media and Common Sense where you can get a better idea as to What's it look like in the land of a 15 year old today? Next is being curious and asking those questions. And this pairs exactly with and don't judge. If your child makes a mistake, treat it as we've been mentioning over and over again today. Treat the behavior as a behavior. Make sure to focus on making sure that that child doesn't make the same mistake again if they come to you saying, hey, this happened or you find out that something occurred, a bullying incident, an incident of bias, do not shame that student. Nobody is able to grow and improve and restore that relationship from a place of shame. So don't judge, but do of course act with urgency. We see a lot of questions coming in about that exactly. So when does that urgent piece come in? We'll get to those in just a moment. Next, share those concerns. If you're a classroom teacher, if you're a campus administrator, and you have specific concerns about a student, or if you're a parent or a caregiver and you have concerns about a student, the trusted adults for that child and student should all be understanding what, what behavior am I seeing at school? What am I seeing at home? 
I think back often to when I was in middle school and I lost my grandpa. The school didn't know. I went to school that next day and my mom called and said, hey, I need to share this concern. And I will never forget my teacher coming to me and saying, I know that something big happened to you. If you need a moment to talk or if you are behaving a little differently today, she didn't say that exactly. But if something happens today, I understand, I see you and I'm here for you. Sharing that concern and having the school know what's going on and having the home know what's going on is really important. Next, valuing people, difference and diversity. Carla mentioned this talking about our framework for anti-bias at the very beginning. But when we value people and differences, we don't need to unlearn those biases because they're not inappropriate to begin with. When we value diversity and we understand and want to know more and are curious about those that are different from us, early on, we don't need to unlearn hate as middle school students, as high school age students, or as adults. Being an ally becomes natural. And finally, keeping that door open. So the purpose of all of this is keeping that conversation going, asking those questions. We on our website even have a guide for asking questions beyond how was school today? Because we know that won't always elicit a very thorough response. But how do we dig a little bit deeper? How do we keep that door open? Somebody shared in the chat with us a quote just now. I understand you. I understand. I see you. And I am here for you. Exactly that. All right, thank you, Danielle. So next steps, and these are actually the pre-steps. These are the proactive things that educators, parents, caregivers, students themselves should do right now. Check out the school and the district's bullying harassment policy. They should have one. Many states require it by law that schools have one. If not, there is... Um, state and federal protections as well that fall on that. But there should be some sort of policy. There should be the person to talk to. And if you cannot go to that English teacher because there might be a riff or there might be some conflict and you're not getting to the principal and you've gone through those appropriate ladders, find that Title IX coordinator. Yes, it's usually they involve with gender, and I know Title IX, everybody goes, oh, but it's not a sports issue. Title IX is more than sports, but those folks are also very, very learned in all of these policies and the laws um, that follow these. As Daniel said, continue the conversations at home. Lots of table talks on our website of things that you can just talk about over dinner, talking points and just continue the conversation. When students talk about an incident at school, encourage them to come forth with it and ask about incident. You know, did they um, you know, share the incident with, with anybody? Did they report it? Encourage schools to join ADL's No Place for Hate framework. As you can see in our backgrounds, uh, real and virtual otherwise, sorry, mine's, um, no Place for Hate is a framework that takes all of the social emotional learning programs and anti-bullying curriculum and the passion of educators and especially the students. It gives them a framework to take all of that under and declare that their school is not only lowercase, just No Place for Hate, but also it is capital. This is school is absolutely there's no place for hate. Um, and we've done the work to, to show that. And then on to incident response. I know um, Carla had mentioned um, and Jillian put into the chat our official ADL incident response where you can go on the website and report an incident. We also have um, an incident guide for middle school and high schoolers, uh, educators and administrators that you can find at the end of the brand new, what is on your screen right now, um, Responding to Bias Incidents in Middle and High Schools mini lesson, um, which is really, really great. That talks about what to do in the moment as well as next steps that you can take. 
You can scan for this resource and many others uh, on the QR code that is up on the screen, as well as I believe it was the link was put in the chat. Um, and I believe it will also be included when we send a follow up email um, either later today or tomorrow for those who have registered. All right. Thank you so much, Danielle and Dan and Carla. We have loads of people in the chat that are wanting to delve into your your wisdom in more specific ways. Lots of fabulous questions here. Um, first one um, I want to address. It's um, it's a it's an incident of anti-Semitic bullying, um, and it's a, a family that is sounds like they're they're struggling um, in navigating a middle school age son that has been a target of daily anti-Semitic gestures and hate speech um, for, for an extended period of time. Um, they've had conversations with administration. Um, they're, they're really looking for help and they're, they're at a loss. Um, the school's been resistant in recommending um, the parents implementation of No Place for Hate. Things that um, maybe we'll start, we'll, we'll, we'll round robin this. We'll start with, with Danielle and then we'll, we'll, we have another question I think that is more specific for Dan and then we'll go to Carla. But for this one, Danielle, um, things that you would recommend um, that the school would do to take action in a situation where um, the type of hate is specific to anti-Semitic bullying. It's both um, gestures and hate speech and the school's resistant to adopting um, like a anti uh, no place for hate framework in addressing it. Absolutely. First, thank you to the caregiver that shared this in the chat with us. Um, first, I go right back to the pyramid of hate. Where does this fall within that? This, the repeat, that it's repeated, that it's happening consistently, and also the use of hate speech and hate signals. This is an escalated incident. This is not just a simple act of bullying that if the school is not handling appropriately, you would consider potentially escalating it. I know as a former campus administrator, if that behavior doesn't stop really quickly, you get into some really ugly spaces because what we know about anti-Semitism is also that there's usually other hate happening right around there and that you have an issue on campus that needs to be addressed with urgency and immediately. We have some resources online for educators to go through so that way they can be more comfortable because I hear this a lot. Something happened that was anti-Semitic at my school, but I don't wanna to touch it. I'm worried, I'm nervous, I'm scared. How do I interrupt and intercept when I hear and when I see this? We have not only the course, the mini course that was linked already, but another one that targets specifically, how do I interrupt and what do I look for when it comes to anti-Semitic hate and bullying at my school? I would recommend as an administrator for my staff to go through that course, to know how to interrupt and intercept. Um, but as the parent or caregiver, if it's not stopping, that's not okay. And that was that is something we want to make really clear here today. If the behavior is ongoing and continuous and you feel like your child is unsafe and not getting relief, escalate. That is okay to have to do. Dan and Carla, do you have anything to add? Dan, yeah, I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, so absolutely, the mini course is a wonderful recommendation. It's a self-paced course. Um, I find that often, at times if if a school and and leadership doesn't fully understand you know perhaps there's not you know clarity around what anti-semitism is and when it's something that 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 folks don't understand oftentimes there's a bit of paralysis around it the other thing i would i would remind us is that uh, when you report an incident to um adl one of the reasons why it's important for us is because when we see an incident over and over again, maybe coming from the same school or the same school district, and we can identify a pattern, that's when somebody like me as an education director would reach out to the school and say, hey, you know, you have an issue here and there's a pattern and we have some data that shows that there's some bullying going on around anti-Semitism. So those are the couple things that I would, I would um, add to the conversation. Dan, I don't know if you have anything. No. I right. think it's an excellent point, Carla. I mean, and we have we have a wonderful mini course that helps kind of shed light on what is anti-Semitism, what does it look like, how 
how do you how do you stop it when you see it? And I think empowering educators who don't understand something is the first step um, in creating more inclusive space, especially specifically when it when it comes to anti-Semitic hate. Uh, another question in the chat. This one I'm going to throw at you, Dan. Um, questions about what about zero tolerance policies? What 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 do we think about about them as it pertains to hate and bullying? Yeah, great question. It comes up often. Um, I have lots of personal reasons and reasons and evidence from experience and, and being in the classroom. But first and foremost, zero tolerance policies do not work. They have been shown to not improve school climate or school safety. Its application usually is in suspension and expulsion has just not been an effective means of, of improving student behavior. Um, in fact, it can also exacerbate issues of marginalized overrepresentation in school punishments when there's a zero tolerance policy. Uh, they don't consider the why behind the behavior, um, either from the uh, person doing the bullying, uh, showing the bullying behavior, or the responses to it. We need to focus on the why before the punitive. Uh, if folks, and that's why I'm saying take a breath. We all want, we go to, towards the punitive. We had another question about, well, what about the, we're focusing on the students who are bullied. What about the uh, student who is doing the bullying behavior? Um, that all falls into um, that punitive. We need to focus on the behavior and focus on ed the education side of it. Yes, there are policies. Yes, there are punishment consequence ladders that the district has, schools follow, all of the things. But I really encourage folks and promote the idea that we have to stop, take that breath, consider each incident as its own unique event because it really, really, truly is. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that getting to the why as educators is critical. And I would also highlight that the new mini lesson that's specific to um, addressing um, hate incidents, incidents of bias in K through 12 spaces, is all about trying to figure out ways to make these incidents into teachable moments. When we're dealing with youth, um, unpacking the why and, and, getting, and getting to a place where we learn from an incident like this is, is really our goal. Um, questions about Title IX. Somebody says, "What's unpack that for me? What is a what's a Title IX coordinator? What what, what does that exist? Talk, talk to me more about that. Who wants to take that one, Dan?" <laughs> uh, I'm happy to do that one as um, somebody who worked in equity specialist uh, with K through 12 schools. Yes, Title IX states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That's a lot of words to say that we cannot discriminate on the basis of gender. When people hear Title IX, especially in college and high school sports, it is that. It's an athlete athletes, because that's where it really came up initially. But this follows everything. This follows anything and everything to do um, with gender. Schools that receive federal funding, public schools, are required to have a Title IX coordinator either at the school or the district level. So there is that person who, and unfortunately, it's also usually the head of HR or the XYZ person. It may not be a single um, role. Um, it could fall under some, uh, somebody else's duties. Um, but Title IX is great, an office for civil rights um, if it escalates to that point. Um, that's also another way that you can report online anonymously to the Office for Civil Rights, which falls right under the US Department of Ed. Thank you, Dan. Um, this is another one at middle school. Um, since my middle schooler is ha uh, has a peer who's always finding some way to say something about her, her Jewish identity. Um, now, 
the son, who's also in middle school, has a peer that continues to say things um, kind of highlighting the, the Jewish identity. Um, and uh, it, I think it, it sounds like the students may, um, you know, the daughter advises the, the, the daughter advises the son, like, just ignore it. Um, but this parent is wondering, what do you what do you do if somebody's highlighting an element of your Jewish identity or otherwise that's making you uncomfortable? Um, how what what advice should a parent be giving? Who wants to take that one? Carla, you want to take that one? Well, I'm not sure <laughs> that I want to take that one. Um, I'm just thinking about identity in general. Um, when we approach this work, identity is the, the, the beginning point. It's where we can all have, have a voice. And, um, you know, when working with schools, um, we have curriculum and we have activities that teachers can use to build community where they're exploring everybody's identity, right? So in a perfect world, you know, we try to create moments where if everybody is free to share their identity, then it's not just a Jewish identity or it's not just the black identity, right? It's everybody's identity and we can learn so much. Not only can we appreciate other people, but then we find those ways that our, our identities overlap. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking right away, you know, no place for hate uh, activities. We have uh, some wonderful anti-bias curriculum guides for middle school. Um, and for everybody on this call, no matter where you reside, you have an education director like me, like Danielle, like Dan, reach out and allow us to help you find the resources that could maybe move uh, the path forward in whatever you're dealing with with your schools. That's perfect. We appreciate that, Carla. I will just wrap up in saying a lot of the questions in the chat are about whether or not we offer any kind of continuing education for this webinar. While we don't have any accreditation for this hour that we've spent together, the new mini lesson that we that we linked does come with a certificate. It takes about 20 minutes to take. Um, we encourage you to, to check it out and to share it within your sphere of influence. Um, and it does come with a, a certificate at the end that you can um, put in your professional development folder or share with your campus administrator if, if you need it. Um, I uh, will be sending out all of the uh, mini lessons that we talked about today, as well as other uh, educational resources in an email tomorrow, along with the recording of this webinar. I know many people are looking for the deck. Um, email us and we'll, we'll talk about whether or not there are certain slides that would be useful for you. Um, so that's that's uh, all coming your way. Any final thoughts before we close out today? Danielle, Dan, Carla, anything I'm forgetting? Just thank you so much. Seeing the number of attendants and how interested people are in this conversation just tell, reminds us how important the work is that we do every single day. And just a huge thank you to my colleagues and experts, Carla and Dan for co-facilitating. And thank you, Jillian. We're so glad to have you here. On behalf of ADL, we want to thank you for joining us. And we thank you as caregivers and community partners and be on the lookout for our resources coming at you via email tomorrow and a brief survey that you can complete now. Goodbye.